Good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome to the Embassy of Ireland's Irish Friday Club series of speaking events. My name is Thomas Benny. I'm the head of public diplomacy at the Embassy of Ireland here in Berlin, and I'm accompanied by my colleague, Dr. Elias Benna. And we are delighted to present to you today to introduce to you Morgan Smith, who moved to Germany some years ago and got into the bar business, entertainment, all around um, achiever, who then uh, decided that he was going to open up his own bars in Berlin. And he has expanded it into a variety of different things, which we're going to hear about today. Now, I just want to say a few words. If we could just ask everybody to have their microphones on mute, please. And if your connectivity is faster by having your camera off, that's all well and good. We can still see that you're there. When Morgan has finished his uh, talking, you want your hand up to, if you want to ask a question, or you can do it digitally as well. And we'd be delighted to have you and to have some interaction. Now, I know that you don't want to listen to me rattle on. You want to listen to Morgan's story. So Morgan, you're more than welcome. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. We're delighted to have you. And thanks very much for taking the time out of your busy day to, to tell your story of moving to Germany, moving to Berlin and doing what you're doing now. You have uh, two very successful, as I understand it, bars here in Berlin one of which uh, also has a hairdressing uh, element, which uh, I have to say your beard and your hair is looking very uh, trim today. <laughs> so I might, have to, uh, I might have to drop down there later myself and get some oil and some fitting. So Morgan, please take it away. Uh, yeah, the floor is yours. We can give you a half off for just a beard if you need it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> half price, okay. Uh, hi guys, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Uh, for giving us a bit of a, a platform to chat about uh, the messing I've been doing over the past uh, 12 years or so here. Um, yeah, I'll give you a bit of background about me, what, what I did before, and then starting the bars and some challenges we had with that. And then uh, if I have time, I'll go over kind of some of the stuff we did during COVID that was a bit, a bit different, I think, than some other people did to, to keep, us, keep us going. Um, yeah, so I'm from I'm from Dublin, North Dublin, a uh, place called Bayside. Um, just so I most of my my experience there was in um, I done all sorts of jobs, but gastronomy was it, it's the same there. I started off in uh, working mainly in bars in Hout, uh, North Dublin, and uh, I started off as a, a bar back, you know, filling the fridges when I was a teenager, and then uh, worked with the lounge boy, and then. A little bit in the grey area when it was legal, about 17 or so, I started working behind the bar. <laughs> um, and yeah, I did that for a while here. Um, and then I got offered a job in 2010 in Göppingen in, uh, in the south of Germany. It's not far from Stuttgart. Uh, and it was a kind of a, like, they, the guy rang me saying we need, he rang me on a Tuesday saying they needed me to start on a Thursday. And I said, where's Göppingen? Like, what country is it in? Um, but it was to run an Irish bar there. And uh, I said, I'm sure I'll give it a go. I don't speak German. And he said, you just need to learn your numbers and your fruits on the plane and you should be okay. And it turned out he needed quite a bit more to be in that part of the, the country at that stage. But uh, so it worked, worked well. It was kind of to bring in and uh, to, to help him kind of flip the place a bit. And, um, but uh, it, it wasn't really for me down there. Um, I was working place was closed on Sundays and I know in Berlin like some shops are closed on Sundays but in that town everything was closed on Sunday so I was basically just living in the bar and um, I got offered a job in a bigger place in Stuttgart and then just before I took the job I said you know I'm, I'm too young to be working this much all the time and not seeing anything so I think I was 21 or 22 at that stage and I uh, I, like in the middle of the night at one stage, I, I just got a, a car share and I just took everything I could carry and, and left for Berlin. Uh, I knew one person here and I think it was it was like after a night out, I said, F this, <laughs> and I kind of just left. Um, and I rang her on the way here and just said, can I stay on your couch at like seven in the morning? And I said, I have enough money to, to float around Berlin for a month. I visited here before and and... I'd lo always loved the city, but I said, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see, see what I can do. And uh, I stayed on a couch for, for a while. And then 
I started looking for jobs and I eventually got a job in a, a bar restaurant. Um, they needed a focaccia chef. And I told them I'd, uh, I ran a, I told them I worked in a gourmet pizza restaurant in Ireland before called Apache Pizza. It was actually Apache Pizza, like <laughs> the, uh, uh, which is like the equivalent to Domino's for anybody who doesn't know in Ireland. Um, but I got my foot in the door and I knew how to throw the dough and I could I bagged my way in and then he said, Oh, I actually need a sous chef for for the rest of the, the restaurant in the daytime. And I said, Oh, I could do that. And he said, Is there not a lip below your your pay grade? And I was like, No, it's grand. So I started washing dishes there and uh then the chef at one stage went on a visa run and he got uh, refused at the border. So I became a head chef overnight <laughs> in, in a place when I'd never cooked before. Which was a bit of a baptism of fire, but it actually taught me a lot. Um, so uh, I learned that, and then worked my way to what really was really keen to get back into into the bars. I started work bartending again in 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 a nightclub called Clyderiza. I don't know if anybody's aware of it. It's a, it was an Irish owned nightclub here at Spreeball Platz, and uh, we used to call it the the underground embassy. <laughs> the, yeah. We had, uh, there was, it was basically, it was, it was three Irish guys read it and set it up and started it. Um, and I don't know if any of them have ever been on this before. They eventually opened up Loffus Hall, which is still there. Um, it's not in their hands anymore. But from there, I started bartending a bit more and started doing um, more cocktail competitions. And um, through that, I was doing a, a competition in Ireland, representing uh, Germany in Ireland for a competition for, for uh, for Jemison, uh, called the Bartender's Ball, and I met a guy here who was who owns a big, a big uh, restaurant here, a steakhouse restaurant, who was planning on opening a, a bar in Prince Lauerbrook. And we talked a lot on the trip. And then when I came back, he, he asked me if I'd like to be involved in it. And I went and seen the space, and uh, I seen the space, and then I seen the the, uh, and I fell in love with the space and. They talked about the plans of what they wanted to do with it. And I met his other business partner. And uh, then we decided to go ahead with it. We went in, I think it was, we were supposed to open in uh, May. I, I, I quit everything else in, in around March. And we didn't open until October 12th, uh, 2012. So there was a lot of stuff with the builds and that kind of got pulled back a bit. And and then I just had, but I'd quit my job. So I was kind of bouncing between like just being a kind of gun to hire, bar, gun for hire bartender. And uh, it seemed to go okay. Like, uh, to, to, like w once we got in the door and, and opened up, we thought everything would be plain sailing then. But uh, we actually had a lot of pushback from, from the locals because they knew we, were, we weren't German. And we had, uh, I, I lived and worked in Kreuzberg mainly. So I had a lot of uh, people saying, what are you doing going up to Prince Thoroughbred? It's just full of buggies and, and parents and nobody goes out there. When they do go out, they go to Kreuzberg. And I said, well, look, there's, there's definitely a market there because if they do get a night off and they're not, they don't have something in the neighborhood, you know, we could actually go and build something there, you know, to make it a cool spot or make it a destination. And now that they still come there now, but when we opened up, we had like uh, in our first week, we'd shy Southlanders painted on the front of the bar and we'd stickers put up on the bar saying, you know, speak German or go home and and really kind of hard stuff. But we just kind of killed it with kindness. You know, we, we, we just kept working on what we were doing. And, you know, we, we were there almost 10 years now. It's 10 years in October. And we're one of the longest lasting places on the on the street now in Stargarter. And what we done was, you know, when everybody come when anybody comes to the neighborhood, I'm always the first person there with a, a bottle of booze and a, and a handshake saying, you know, if you need anything, you need ice, you need this. And whereas before they were they just seen it as competition and that as a bad thing. Um, whereas I seen it as, you know, let's make this a, a destination or a place where you can actually go and you know, get a nice meal or, or eat and, and then go to a good bar. And if there's a few different bars, then, you know, more people will come to the area and won't feel like when they have one night off a week, they have to go to Kreuzberg or something. So, I mean, like even, I think you said Andy on here uh, from Salt and Bone. Um, they grew up, we grew up around the corner from each other and now we have a bar around the corner from each other in Berlin. 
Um, Andy's from Sutton and Becky is from, was from Bayside as well. She, she lived across the street from me. And when they were looking for a venue to open Salt and Bone, which I think was about four or five years after we opened, I said, there was a place across the street I wanted them to take. And Andy said, you know, like this is, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be competition for you then. You know, we, we've, we do, we're going to do craft beers and we're going to be this. And I said, no, like, we, you know, let's, let's make it. So, you know, people go for food there and they go there and, and like, you know, rising tides raise all ships. And that's the way we kind of looked at it now. Now when you, we walk down the street in, and start to Straza, everybody's waving to us and we built up from the overflow from, from bad fish and stuff. And, and I know a lot of other restaurants, there's a barbecue place they said that they only opened up because we were there and they seen that they could do it. And a couple of other bars have opened up saying, saying that they seen the same concept. There's a, a gay bar down the street that's like a, almost a sister bar to us, the uh, Tipsy Bear. And they said they wanted to open like a gay bad fish, basically, or a safe space that's like a gay bad fish. And they're, they're flying now, they're doing so well. So that was kind of it. Like once we got the ball rolling with that, and the, the first couple of years was kind of getting the name out there. Um, and, and most of the problems we fell into then was the normal things you'd have with our ordinance on and stuff, but we found stuff with kind of infighting politics between the bar and the bar owners and stuff with uh, we had a business partner who was so I, I I came in and I was running the place um, but uh, like after a while it was you'd see there, there was two owners who opened the place together and then stopped talking with each other so I had to run the place on my own they were supposed to do the whole business end of it but I just didn't hear from them for, for a year or so so how I eventually developed to be the owner, Dennis, that I, I, I need to have equal shares, with, which is at least uh, if you want me to keep running the place so I can do it efficiently. So I had everything on my back to do it, but I had to, if I wanted to make any changes, I'd have to call one of them and they'd fight with each other over about it for a while. And at that stage, they had like blacked out windows and, you know, they, like one of the owners would come in and play a lot of really like metal on repeat and things. and. It just wasn't working, and I said, I, if, I, "If I don't have control here, I can't. I can't do it." Um, one of the owners completely agreed with me, and and uh, the other one kind of just had to go along with it. Um, but eventually, so I became equal equal partner with them, and I could make some changes and start hiring my own crew, and it started to grow and grow a bit more. And then once we had a bit more um, experience and capital, then we were able to buy out the other partner. And once that happens, you know, I could make the changes I want and start building up my crew. I'll just show you some photos of in the the uh, before the build and while we were building. Hang on. Yeah, so that's what it was. I don't if you've been in it before. It's that's like about halfway through the builds. You know what happened? Why it, why it took so long? There was a lot of like wood paneling and stuff there that that and. All this stuff was done by like a specialty car specialist carpenter who lives about an hour outside Berlin. So in order to get it right, it took a lot longer. We also have a luft our luftung is like it's like a fifty thousand euro luftung and it took a lot longer to put in. Um, so you go know, that's some more. That's it a bit more done. Um, and then yeah, once that was done and the build was done, we spent the next while building it up and just getting the name there of what it was. Uh, yeah, that was in our first when we first opened up our first flyer we did and that's kind of the outside a bit after that um and that's this is more what it looks like now um so we we uh once we had that up and running and john had left the, the uh our other partner had, had left we i could really take the tint down start building our crew and that's kind of what made the place what it is you know like it's 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 the staff we beforehand. If I hired a staff member, if I hired, hired a friend or, or someone like that, they could uh, they could ask them at any stage. And I was I, so I I wouldn't hire somebody that I knew or somebody the building and people that I could trust was kind of what made it. You know, like we're a lot of people would think we're an Irish bar, but we're not. We're an Irish owned place that does good Guinness, really good Guinness, but doesn't necessarily mean that we're an Irish bar. Um, the thing that's more Irish about it, I think, is that we you know we give good customer service with a little bit of sass and things but it's a thing that, that can be lacking in this city is you know like good drinks but you know the the, the atmosphere and the 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 camaraderie they have i mean 
I think there's there's something like after building up the name and building up the brand, there's, there's a, there's, I'd say there's over 20 people who have bad fish tattooed on their arms. And I'll show you some photos. Actually. Uh, the, let me see if I have some here. Yeah, like, I don't have one yet. <laughs> but uh, a lot of people have have them on them. Uh, and like, you know, it, it, we, we became more of like a family and a kind of sense, sense community within, within the place. And that, that comes from our crew and building up our, 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 st our staff and stuff. Um, and and getting, getting it like, not just the name out there, but people that, who, who see it as, because in, in Berlin, it's a lot like cities like New York and stuff, which is we kind of built a lot of it based on like a, like a Brooklyn style neighborhood bar. Um, so that's kind of what, for a lot of people then it's, that's, that's their front room. Like they don't have somewhere else to go uh, or like, you know, if they live in a big here and, you know, this is the place. So it's not people who might be there every day. They're not there getting drunk every day necessarily, but they'll come in and that's their sense of community and things. So uh, we definitely like built that up as much as we could. Um, and then uh, after it was running for a while, I got approached from a, a, a friend who, who, who used to run a, a a Mexican restaurant here and asked if I wanted to do another bar with him and we eventually opened a place called um, Soma in in Friedrichsheim um, so this is the place before it was an old record shop and um, we cleared off all the things and got the exposed brick out and stuff and uh, then eventually it became Soma which was supposed to be run by by the guy who was investing in it, I was supposed to set up with, help him set up and do more because I had a bit more experience with the stuff. Um, and it went, it started off going well. And then once he started taking the reins of it a bit more, I realized he, he really wasn't into it in the same way that I was, or, or he didn't have to kind of, he, wanted, he was in it for the wrong reasons. I think a lot of people want to open a bar and they don't realize how hard it is. Um, they don't they just think it's just a party all the time and it's not it's just, it's a 24-hour job you never you know like a pipe goes or anything like that you can be anywhere in the world back home but anything going on and you still have to deal with it and he didn't see that and see how much work it was so um eventually we parted ways but the way it had, it had been run because he was running the day-to-day -day, it had kind of left a bit of a bad name over over the Somo brand so when I took it back over and started running it myself, we turned it into Little Fish, which is uh, was was then taken into the Bad Fish Team we had group. It's a bit more our style with like the lighting and you know the the on, on the except for brick and stuff, and just tried to give it the same kind of charm as we had there, and uh, and that went that, that went really well. Uh, it was the, the the difference between that and and Prince the one in Prince Lauerberg is. Like every venue is different and you can assume you can, especially with bars, you have it with restaurants that you can have a place that, you know, cause you're bringing dishes that are the same. It's easier to move it with bars. A lot of it is the feel of the place. And when you open up a place, you kind of have to let it like talk to you and say, what's, what's the different quirks and stuff for it and, and what you can find that, that works there. And so I it had its, 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 its own different vibe to it, but a big thing with the rent for it, for the area that it was in is that it needed to be packed. And when um, when COVID came around, we had uh, I was I I knew that's our I get as well. <laughs> uh, I knew I knew it wasn't going to. Uh, I could see some quizzical looking faces. It's it's like the Sally's Cap challenge. I don't know if you ever did it before. You have to in your first mouthful. You have to try and get it in between the Guinness sign and the harp. And the, and if you do it, you make it onto the wall. It gets people to, to down a lot of Guinness. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we knew. I knew with the with the change and what happened in in with COVID that I didn't think the the, the venue in Friedrich sign was gonna because you have to be packed in. Our Luftung isn't as good, and it's a smoking bar as well. Um, and I just didn't see people being as comfortable uh, in there again. And also, what we seen was where our um, with. Uh, with people coming coming in and out during, during lockdown when we had the doors open outside and stuff and, and wanting to, to come back in, there is definitely a demand for it to stay there. And we, we had to do something because we're still on a rental contract there. So I had to do something that was a bit more different with the space. 
And what I looked at was the first thing to close besides the nightclubs was the bars and they were last thing to open back up. And the last thing to close was the hairdressers and was the first thing to open back up. So we needed to have something that we did. We had all my eggs in one basket with, with just slinging drinks, like, you know, so we, we got, we, I knew uh, the, the guy who ran Rowdy's, which is like a chain of barber shops. And he's probably the best barber in the city. Um, and I said, look, we could probably fit in a few chairs there and, and I put it in the back, but we didn't want to do it kind of half fast. So we put in a really nice barber shop in it, which is like after changing it, building into Soma and then changing it into Little Fish, we were back in a building site again, which was frustrating, but uh, needed to be done. And uh, I can see the lads in there now. So it's, it's basically meant, meant you can have it so half the bar is still the bar area and it's not open most nights a week, but you can still get, you know, a, de a decent pint of Guinness and uh, that's just having a, the first cut in the barbershop with a, with a, with a pint. And um, and it does kind of diversifies our portfolio a bit. It meant that we, if it, you, if you're, we didn't know when you'd be able to drink drinks again and if people were going to be comfortable with uh going back into a space that size and being around each other. And I still don't know if they, they will. I mean, we've had busy nights now and stuff, but uh, I don't know whether or not it's it's ever going to get back to, to where it was before. But uh, yeah, and then with, with there, I was probably, if, if there's anything I'm, I'm uh, glancing over a bit too much, just uh, say at the end and I'll go back into it a bit more. I'm just a bit more conscious about time. Uh, where the other shop would, um, when, it, when COVID hit as well, we had to do, we done a lot of uh, just kind of taking on our feet. I remember we we closed, we we had our, our biggest day of the year is probably St. Patrick's Day, that or our anniversary. Uh, and St. Patrick's Day was on a Tuesday and we had a big party planned and they said they were going to close on the Tuesday, like the bars completely. So we said we'll have it on the Monday. And then we were having a meeting about it on the Monday and they came in, the police came in, we were having a meeting about meeting about it on the Sunday or uh, Saturday and the police came in and shut us down completely. And we were kind of banking a lot. We, we got audited twice that year. We were banking on it a lot. So we went into to COVID with uh, really on the kind of back foot. But once we, once we did it, it was once we knew, because well, we didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew we were going to have to hustle and, and figure out a way to to keep keep it going and uh, and also keep keep the bar in people's minds. So what we done was we said, look, we're gonna to have to get created. The first thing we did was bring the staff in. We brought them in on, on St. Patrick's Day. Um, and we kind of got rid of some of the Jemison we'd bought in for the day that we wasn't gonna get used. And uh, just reassured them that like, I know a lot of places like just fired all their staff straight away and said, you're better off getting, getting uh, getting work somewhere else. And I said, I'm not, well, not getting work somewhere else, but just like uh, getting benefits and, and we don't really know what's going to happen. And I, all, our, all our staff are on contracts and they're on salaries. So uh, like it would, it, it, it was doing the Kurtz about, and we didn't even know there was going to be a Kurtz about, about at that stage. But I said, I'm not sending these lads into a pandemic without health insurance, you know? Um, and we kept them on and we made sure that we set them down. We said, look, the no matter what happens, here's the, the next month's pay already. And we just kind of cleared out with that. And we said, we're going to keep doing as much as we can to keep everybody on the books for as long as we can and do everything we can to do that. And if it means doing whatever, we'll do whatever. And then we did whatever. We done, uh, let me see if I got a photo of it. We done, um, we done a GoFundMe campaign first, which is I kept the backfish swimming. So we done t-shirts through that. We done um we done uh different uh, prints. We done we done a I wonder if I have a photo of the bingo. Uh we done bad fish bingo, which was a bloody nightmare. <laughs> I'm kind of getting flashbacks of it now doing this. Is that, like since we stopped doing the bingo, I've been avoiding Zoom like the plague. So <laughs> we had it, we had it on in, in the in in the bar um, on Friday nights, we, people could come in and just log in and then, you know, have a chat with each other before we leave the window up before and everybody would have a drink in their own apartments. And we weren't really making a huge amount of money from it. It was like 10 euro for the for, for a ticket or something like that to, to do it. Um, but we usually gave away, we probably make 
I know a few hundred euros off it, but I'd always give away about twice that in free drinks for when we reopened. So it'd be like if someone won a line of these things, they win 10 points of Guinness or they'd win, like we know all their, their, their order so we'd win them like that but it's just kind of a bit of fun to keep it going and keep it in people's minds and, and keep that sense of community there um so we done we done that for uh the first few months until we could start doing drinks outside again and then we started doing uh takeaway drinks uh we done um do i have more photos of that uh we don't take yeah drinks drinks to go we done drinks for like i think it was summer when we start first started doing the drinks outside and it was really it was a really gray area for bars restaurants have been given the the go ahead to 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 uh to to sell takeaway but bars weren't given anything there was a lot of gray areas with it and i know like hokey pokey is across the street from us and uh this ice cream place and a queue goes like round around the block and they're all like right beside each other the first day we opened up selling drinks, we, one of our, our main staples is our, our slushy machine. We do like frozen margaritas and frozen honey sours and they, they change from time to time. And so we set up the, the, the stall outside and then we had two police officers show up like within 20 minutes of being open. And I was like, oh my God. And I could see the female officer was in the car and she's going crazy like this. And I said, I said oh, no, no, she's going to kill us. Like, because we didn't know it was exactly legal. And she said, uh, she came out of the car and she goes, bloody Prince Lauerberg, of course they call us over something stupid like this. And I was like, is this okay? And she goes, yes, it's fine. It's fine. I don't know. She's like, somebody called, but what you're doing is a lot safer than what a lot of other people are doing. And I said, okay. And then the, the other officer said, is, is this legal? And I said, well, over there are doing, are doing that and he said yes so that's ice cream and I said well this is big boys ice cream <laughs> and he just laughed and said that's okay you know like so fi figuring this stuff out on the fly and anytime anybody said you know this isn't okay we pulled out of doing it and later on in the winter we done like blue vine outside and it really took off and, it, and this was all just going towards uh, topping up our staff's wages and making sure they're okay because if they're on curtsy by and they lose their salary that's one thing, but if they're like mainly the owners, we're just running this ourselves. Um, but they lose their, their curts out by it, so they're getting 70% of their salary, but they're also losing their tips, which is another half their salary. Um, so we we're, we're conscious of that. So it was basically just going into to keeping keeping them paid and, and the lights on and stuff as well. Um when it came to Christmas and we were or around Christmas time, we were doing the blue vine, a lot of the streets and our a lot of the bars in our street started doing it and it became almost like a Christmas market. And once it got a bit too busy, we said, look, we have enough to pay the staff and we stopped you know, and we could have stayed open way longer, but it was just, it was getting like the, the Christmas markets were closed for a reason and we were turning the street into a Christmas market. So we called it then. So we, we've been, we've been on board with, with changing stuff as much as we could, but um, yeah. And we got through that and I managed to get to, uh, I'm just conscious of how much I got over time. Uh, we, 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 uh, we managed to get uh, back open uh, to an extent. And when we reopened doing, uh, uh, we done like brunches and things. Cause for, for restaurants, they could do two servings, but we, we had the bar closing at 10 o'clock and then 11 o'clock. And so we had to get really creative about, you know, we, we make most of our money between you know, 11 o'clock and three o'clock in the morning. So it's, it's, we do angry hour for two hours a day, which is two euro beers. So we're not really making money till later in the evening. So we had to do like, we don't like brunches and all these other kind of things, just getting as creative as, as possible. We also went to places that we knew that were like shutting down and wanted to get rid of their stock so we could get in cheaper stock so we could sell stuff cheaper on the streets and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it went well and we managed to managed to get get through and get up and running. Um but yeah, the last while has been a bit more like kind of testing things and and we really felt it on St. Patrick's Day was the first day we kind of felt all right, we're we're kind of back a bit this year. Now there was the bar was properly full and we just kind of seeing it like that, we were all a bit emotional, you know, the bar being like four deep and and people thinking it was just, just you just never know are, are people actually going to come back you know and i think the main thing was keeping the community going and people not 
if people still want to come back and keeping yourself in in, in the eye in, in, in people's mind's eye when 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 they're not there you know um yeah and it kind of led us back up to now um and we have the the barbershop still going well we're not we're, we're probably open up, up more um we're, we're kind of conscious of it doing a having too many people inside when they're doing the cuts and things. So we're not open to the public at the bar as much, but once we have a terrace outside, we'll probably do that a lot more. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> um, I, I, I skimmed over a lot of things. So if you want me to talk about something a bit more or other stuff that we've done, um, just let me know. Thanks very much, Morgan. That's been quite the uh, overview of what you're doing and where you came from. And, uh, yeah, there's a couple of things there that uh, you said that uh, caught my attention, and I'm sure there's a lot of other people who'd like to ask a lot of questions, but the uh, Apache pizza is, uh, <laughs> is great. It makes a difference from uh, saying Apache pizza, where you have like a bit of cheese here and a bit of salami over yeah. there. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and it's very interesting that you went, uh, you went to uh, Ireland and represented Germany in the Germans and uh, bartender's ball uh event i remember that used to get a lot of coverage all right yeah yeah and you know something you said there when you just said look it's an irish owned place uh, rather than an irish bar with good guinness and i i think you've, you you've really hit on something there because there's an awful lot of people say oh look there's this great irish bar and they try to go with the, you know how an irish bar might have looked in ireland uh, or this idea and if you if the setting looks like it's in Ireland, then yeah, it's the then it should be grand. But it, it's like you say, it, it's a house is only a house until it becomes a home, and it's about the atmosphere. An Irish bar is only an Irish bar if you've got the crack, if you've got the uh, yeah, you've got the, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I think a lot. I think a lot of things is uh, the the uh, a lot of things. Is, it comes down to if you you've like st the stigma that goes with calling an Irish bar. Yeah, like if if you like a place that's more like it is in Ireland. Like I think Salt and Bones is a similar thing, you know, they're, they're Irish owned and they try to give off the feel of a restaurant in Ireland. But uh, they, given it, like if you if you give it the thing saying, you're just going to stick a lot of shamrocks in the window and call it an Irish bar, they expect you to, you know, be playing oh. rugby every weekend. It's just going to be full of stag do's and that kind of vibe. And it's really not what we, what, what we tend to do is people who are nice in the bar, we treat really, really well. And that's how we have good regulars. And people who aren't, we don't, you know, like, so it ends up, it ends up self-policing itself then, you know, like we, 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 you only want a certain amount of people in. Um, so like, like a certain, a certain kind of like, if you've just slagged is there for a whole weekend, it's a small enough space, a group like that will, will completely dictate everybody else's night. We also very rarely show sports. Like we're more like an Irish bar that you'd have like in, in Ireland where, like I, I, a lot of the bars in Ireland now just have screens everywhere, but I think the most, the best bars in Ireland are usually ones that don't even, have, like we have music, but they don't have any music and they don't have any screens and it's about your drink and your company, you know? So we're going for that more than having screens in every in every corner. So it's, and that's, that, that, like we've had, I had people there for the Six Nations who were like shouting at me because I didn't have the, the rugby on and I said look that's, we never advertised that we were going to put it on and it's they were like but that's your responsibility and I said why <laughs> um yeah there is I I I, I, my, I have I have a Canadian business partner I have an American business partner and I have a German business partner and so like a lot of some people think we're a Canadian business bar as well you know build, building our our team like uh, my bar, bar manager and partner Miles is is Canadian and he's he's there on the ground a lot and there's there's a few Canada flags all over the place so people come in and be like oh that that Canadian bar you know like I don't mind people saying whatever it is it's just it's a, it's a space and that people decide what it is when when they're in in there you know um I did, but I think a lot of stigma can come with with Irish bar I I love an Irish bar as much as the next guy but uh, it's just not what we are you know. Yeah, and, and Claire has, uh, has just uh, mentioned there, Claire uh, Murray, she uh, has said, look, it's a wise move not to call it an Irish bar. I think lots of Germans have an instinctive bad response to that because they think it's a stag do crew, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, diversifying your business sounds a great plan, Morgan. Given a difficult climate, have you new ideas that you would like to explore? Now, Claire, if you'd like to come in as well, uh, vocally, by all means too, but I've already uh, given your question. Have you new ideas that you would like to explore? Is the question from... 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, we've looked at different, like, like at the moment, uh, like diversifying. But I've I've done I've done other projects as well throughout the years that haven't haven't worked. And I think one thing I've learned is like I I I took over, uh, was involved in a like a chain of big uh, burger restaurants for a while, and I almost burnt out. And I think you can spread yourself too thin. Um, we've been, we've had offers to book bad fishes in loads of different cities and 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 put like five of them in in Berlin, and it does it, it's a thing that doesn't scale like that. You know, it's it's not um like uh, as I we was saying before, bars are, are like depending on the space that they're in, they're very different. You know, you can't just say it's bad fish just in name, and you end up like diluting your brand a bit more if you do it that way. But I'm always open to I. We get offers of things that we're, I'm, we're, we we are already do um, events. We do uh, catering for for uh, festivals. We do food markets from time to time. And if something's brought to me that I think is interesting, that I think brand will work in, um, I do. I'd go ahead with that. I'm also like looking at going back to do more events in in Ireland and stuff once things open open up a bit more. Uh, in before COVID, I was looking at. at getting into more doing the, the festivals in, in, in Ireland, but it's not a, the, obviously that went out the window. So now we're starting to read, look, look at stuff like that again. And I think it, or places that I've done that have worked or I've, I've helped people open up their own places and, and things. It's, it's usually you find a place and if you get a good idea for it or you get a good feel for the space, then you can put something in it. But uh, at the moment, we're just making sure that we're, we're not spread too thin and we make sure the business is, is definitely in the right place before because we're not completely out of the woods yet you don't know what's going to happen we're still with, with covid and and how people are going to come back to it and we still haven't really got tourists back yet so we've got to see how, how, how it works in the next year before we start trying to do lots of new things you know yeah sorry there's someone that someone there wants to come in Claire, no, sorry. You. Yeah, and I'll just, on my, could I have a follow-up question if that's allowed? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just, you were talking about the TV screens and I thought that's something I personally can really resonate with. I find it really, I don't know, I don't enjoy it when you go into a place and there's lots of screens, especially because you have to compete with people to discuss and to have a nice conversation. I wondered what else do you think is important in the context of building a bar? I'm sure you're going to say staff, that's an obvious one, but what else? <laughs> Beyond that, do you think is important in terms of building a, a nice space? Um, well, yeah, you kind of hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Stop is the, is the main thing. Uh, I get what you mean with the, the screens, it could, like, and they usually just leave them on with, with like, you know, Czechoslovakia volleyball on in the background or something like that when there's nothing on. I don't get why they just don't turn off the screens. But it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I think a, a huge part of it is, is not just the staff, but the, 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 how, how you treat the clientele yourself in there. And like you're, you're, if you're building up a community and you know, like you, you, you treat the people who you want drinking there really well and, 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 and not necessarily treat the other people terrible, but you, 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 you need to build up your, the, the, the family that is there and, and, and the, the, the atmosphere is like a huge thing. And it comes from the people that are in it, you know, that it's, I, our bar has always been a safe space for for all we try we try to build up like that and if you know people are in and if they, they if a woman's in and she feels uncomfortable or a man or anybody who feels uncomfortable in the place shutting that down completely straight away is is must be a priority so when people come in they have enough enough space where they can sit and have a, a drink with someone it, it's also good to have have a big tables and small tables so people can have uh, a thing with, with an intimate drink with, with a couple of friends or they can rent out a place where where we've we're table that fits 20 people on it if, if they want to have that um but also that you can come in and have a conversation where the music's not completely blaring and on on a midweek thing and consistency as well is like there's so many bars here that and I, I get it I'd love to close on on a Sunday Monday and stuff but you make it so that people don't go oh is that place open then and we, we, had, we had times where we sat there with not one customer for a whole day but like you need to have consistent kind of open and closing times depending on the day of the week that people don't go because if they don't if, if it's a monday and they want to go for a drink to, to go somewhere else you might have lost them forever so 
even though it might cost a bit of money at the start to you build up a thing, kind of being consistent with your opening hours. So you can really build up regulars that, that come day to day or a few times a week. Uh, thanks, Morgan. Naomi, you've got your hand up there. Um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly ask there about um, your idea about the um, smoking, non-smoking bars, because I just like, I used to smoke when I was a younger person and the, the idea of sitting in a bar and just breathing in other people's smoke is not really enticing. And I find I'm kind of inhibited about going out to bars in Berlin because I think the mo most of them are smokers bars. And um, do you think that it's kind of growing here in Berlin that people, more people don't want to sit in smokers bars or? Yeah, I think, I think the majority of the like bad reviews that we will have, like in, in, in Bad Fish and Prince Lauerberg, especially, we, we, we spent like uh, 50,000 euros on a big, massive love dung that recycles the air 12 times in an hour. I'm very conscious of, but we're on a street. The, the only way this would work is if there's a blanket, uh, complete ban for everywhere, but we can't have anybody outside past 10 o'clock at night. So if you have all the smokers that are there and you're in a street and you've got all these neighbors, I would I don't I don't smoke myself anymore. And I used to, and I would love to not have it. It's not as bad in, in bad fish. You can't you can't smoke in, in Freedy Sign, obviously, because it's a barbershop now. Um and it's not as bad as other bars. You're supposed to have a smoking license, and a lot of places in Berlin don't have them. And in order to have them, you need to have proper ventilation. But it's just not it's not controlled as much here. So I did, there definitely is more and more people who are kind of against it, but if we, at the moment, if we got rid of it, um, we'd get a couple of customers, but we'd lose so much more because we can't have people, we're, we're a late night bar. So if it was a place- And what the bar entrance in um, Friedrichsen is closed? Is it just a barbershop now or is it also a bar still? Or? It's a bar at, at the moment, just because of, um, space wise and time wise we, we only have it open on certain days as as the bar because the guys are just concentrating on, on cutting now uh they're kind of build up build up the team where like you need to you need to book a couple of weeks in advance to, to get in for the hair, hair haircut so um they're they're kind of they're there all all the time and we don't really like people in the background while drinking while they're while they're cutting so it's not really feasible at the moment but once we have seats outside and stuff we'll probably start doing more that you can go in and get a drink and, and things as well we kind of have if, if someone's coming in to get a get a haircut or there's a couple of people you know the original concept and idea is that like a few friends can go and get their haircut and a couple of them have a pint at the bar while they're waiting and you know you can get a cocktail or, or have a have a guinness while you're getting your haircut you know but it, that's had to change so much with, with covid rules because you're not supposed to have a drink in certain times and now it's We'll have, we're, going, we're going to reassess that now that um, the mask mandate's gone and things so people could actually have a drink while they're, while they're getting a cut. Cool. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any further questions, Naomi? Or um, can I move on to Aaron? Just put a question in there in the, in, in the group. And uh, it's um, straight up to the point, Morgan. And you, did, you didn't cover it, but where did you get the name Bad Fish from? <laughs> I was actually talking about this just before we started. Um, I was I had a feeling someone was going to say say it. Uh, so there is, there is a reason why why the name is there, but the reasons that people think the name is there are way better than the actual reason. So I tend not to tell people what it is. Uh, a lot of people think it's because we're we when we first opened we were in between two really shit sushi restaurants. Um, and people, people thought that's, that's where we got the name. Now, they're not there anymore, so I could say this. And then people, call, I've heard people tell stories about like, oh, like it's it's the the, the owner is like his dad was a crazy fisherman and and or these all these. I had someone on a plane tell me about it before, not knowing that I owned it, and telling me it's like, yeah, it's a, it's this bad fish place because he was just like fisherman from Hope who moved over and started this bar here, and. So yeah, the answer is is not as fun as any of them. So I'm just gonna leave it up to people to guess what it is. More than anything. If that's okay. <laughs> I think you said enough. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a, a hand up there from Eilish. If you want to turn your camera on, if you want, or if you uh, just want to turn on your microphone, we can hear you and you can ask your question. Yeah. 
Hi, um, Morgan. Thanks so much for the conversation. Um, I am trying to turn my camera on, but it seems to be set to a different camera. So uh, apologies, I could waste time trying to turn my camera on or I could just ask a question. Um, I have two questions for you, actually. Um, and apologies, I had another meeting, so um, I, I missed the first 10 minutes of your presentation. So apologies if you already answered either of these that questions. That was the best bit. But, um, my first one is, um, you, you did a really great job of, of explaining to us how important community is to Badfish. And I was wondering, is it, it does that community tend to be mostly Irish, or is it mixed, or um, you know, what's the kind of you know demographic of the people who like to come to to Badfish? And then my second question was, um, as you said, you're not an Irish bar, but you do good Guinness. So I was wondering, even though you're not an Irish bar, do you particularly stock Irish drink, or again, is is it kind of a very mixed stock that you would have on hand? Um, and I suppose maybe to just introduce myself <laughs> to, to ask you why, uh, particularly why I'm asking the second question, I'm actually the agricultural attache here in uh, the embassy. Um, I work with, with Thomas and Elise and Marin here in the embassy. So um, yeah, that's just why I was kind of asking the question particularly about the kind of stock that you have on hand. So, um, and thanks, it was really, really interesting um, presentation. So thanks a million for that. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the first part, it, it's a really mixed bag. It's not, there's, there's a good few Irish, there's a, uh, quite a lot of Germans who kind of, because most mostly we speak English in the bar, um, you, you can speak German if you want to, to, to but like, it's a lot of Germans who kind of like to, like to come in and speak English, and um, we've, we've quite a few Americans, a really mixed bag because, you know, that's another thing, a pigeon home to an Irish bar, you tend to have a lot of just Irish and English drinking it, and it's not as much of a, a Melbourne pot, um, but we have a really, really mixed bag. Um, you know, in, in, in the winter, we have more uh, locals, and that doesn't necessarily mean Germans, but people who actually live in, in, um, in Germany. And our, our slow season is actually summer. Uh, but we manage to get by because we get, we get a good few tourists in, because we, we still have quite a good presence on, um, on TripAdvisor and stuff and, and, and things. So that kind of fills that up. But in, uh, it, it's a really, mix, I know it's not a great answer to the question, but it's a really mixed bag. As far as it comes to Irish products, I mean, Guinness, we didn't serve Guinness for the first three years. And the main reason was we, I didn't think we moved enough beer to do it. Uh, I'm kind of precious about, I serve Guinness because I love Guinness, but I don't really drink it. I never used to really drink it outside, outside of, of Ireland that much. Um, but we, uh, the, the people say it doesn't travel well, but the main thing is it, uh, it doesn't sit well, you know, right. and most places will have a place that sits there with a pint uh, keg of Guinness for a week, whereas I wanted us to get to a level where we were busy enough that we could be going through at least a keg a day, so it was fresh to move. And we also put in, when, when, we, when we took the contract on, the conditions where we put in a, a separate fridge, that's, it's like a custom built fridge that's directly underneath the tap, it's separate gas lines and we get the stuff straight, straight from Ireland. For, um, so um, I didn't have it in before that. With product wise, I, I am kind of, I'm always, I'm always want to, to um, help out Irish companies when I can, but we get in what, what, what works, uh, what's good product and, and what will sell well. Um, I've had stuff before from, like we have, we have, we have O'Hara's in at the moment. We, we keep most of our craft beers, we keep in rotation. And, um, but then I've had things as well where people are like, oh, I've got this beer from, I was like, for, for me to stock it in, I'm going to have to sell that for eight or nine euro. And we're not really that price point of a bar. You know, like it's, it's if it doesn't move, I, I won't keep, keep it on. But whenever I can have an Irish company out, I definitely do. But it has to stick with, stick with what works in the bar. Yeah, absolutely. That totally makes sense. Um, thanks, Amelia, for that. Oh, nice meeting you. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Morgan. It's uh, every element that you're uncovering there is uh, highly informative and uh, it's quite interesting. Um, and Elias has a, a question he wants to put to you now. So, Elias, would you want to come in there? Yes. Hi there, Morgan. So uh, we are just going to keep going with uh, questions from uh, the embassy directly to you. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to come back to one thing that you mentioned, which uh, I found very fascinating and also very thought provoking. And that was uh, when the question arose, when uh, uh, the question arose whether uh, to open up a bar in Prenzlau or Berg or not. 
And uh, if I understood that correctly, people uh, were saying that, uh, what do you want to do there in uh, this uh, neighborhood that is populated by a lot of uh, yeah, uh, younger families, young parents? And uh, you mentioned that uh, you believe that there is a market out there. And uh, yeah, uh, I was wondering whether you could elaborate on that. Uh, so the idea, um, or, uh, was your idea that, that you feel that uh, especially uh, parents, younger parents appreciate uh, the vicinity of uh, establishments or of bars uh, because they don't have to travel far or what was your thinking there? I think a lot of it is the, the pe people just kind of said that there's certain parts of the city where, where it's fun now and like it and Berlin's such a, like since I've been here, there's the cool area has moved a few times, you know, and before I got here, Prince Lauerberg was that kind of hip, cool area. Then it was quite spurring and it's not coming and they're saying somewhere else will be the next place to do it. But if people just give up on an area just because of that, and it's, it's if, if you're just thinking of it as one space and one one bar and you're not willing to kind of change the neighborhood a bit yourself or add to it a bit yourself, um, then you're kind of thinking a little bit too small about it. So there's, there's, there's people living in... in in, in this part of the city as well and they're not all you know like young, even if they are people with young families and stuff they still like to go out and life's not over just because you have some kids and and uh and there's still um, definitely a market for for people there and there's also people young people that are living there that that just go to the other side of the city because you know that's where the fun is at and if you could bring the fun to them why would they pay for a taxi or an uber you know um, and I think that's that's the same with, with every bit of the city, you know, like there's 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 people there who, who want it if you have the right space for it and and you can make it work. I met the, like one of the, one of our one of my best friends was like Prince Lauerberg, he, he like would insist on getting a, a an umbrella in his drink because he was on his holidays in Prince Lauerberg from from Kreuzberg. And then he started working there and I was like, it's, it takes you 20 minutes to get here, you know, and it's also boring if you just stay in your own Keats for the whole time you live here and you don't go out and see stuff. So we now know a lot of our, uh, like we're, we're, we see ourselves as a neighborhood bar, but I'd say the majority of, not the majority, but I'd say 50% of the people who drink in the bar aren't from Prince Lauerberg. You know, they, they, they come to us to, to go there and they come to us because they can go and get, and if they have a night out, they can go and get a nice meal and salt and bone and then come over to us or, they can go for a bit of a dance at Tipsy Bear. They can do it. There's, there's lots of stuff to do in the neighborhood. It's like they can not just stay in Badfish, you know? Yes, and I believe that uh, neighborhood and vicinity also play a bigger role now with the pandemic. So uh, mm. I think, uh, yeah, that's a factor there as well. But so uh, thank you for your answer. And also thank you for a great presentation. Oh, thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. Is there anybody else who have any questions there? Because Morgan, I, I, I do want to ask you a question. If there was anything that you were going to do differently, knowing what you know now, and just for the, the sake of the posterity of this event, what tip would you, you know, give to somebody uh, who wants to go about the setting up a business here in, in Germany, or at least in Berlin, uh, in the area that you've done? And I think you made a very important point there where you said that, um, you know, if somebody's heart's not in it, when you were just talking about Soma, they're coming from a different place. And, you know, the realization of it's not a party, the 24-7 mm -hmm. job. Is there anything that you would do differently uh, now that you've had your experience and you've had the, the, the various different um, enterprises over the years? What, what, what advice would you give to anybody? I, I think the main thing is, is like I was saying there, that like, if you're, if you're going to partner up with somebody or you're going to do it yourself is, is to know that it's, it's not all fun and games. And it's, it's, um, it's a, a very time consuming and 24 hour job that you can't just turn off when you go on vacation, you still need to have your phone, which you still need to, and the people that you partner up with need to know that as well. And you can have people who just can seem like that at the start. And once, once they're doing it, you go in and they're drunk the whole time or they're, and they don't realize that this is, it's, you know it's 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 a it's a cutthroat business and if, and if you you don't really get second chances with people and there's there's so much of a selection in the city that like if you, you have somebody come into your your bar or your restaurant and you have a, a guy who's hammer drunk or treats them not well 
they're not going to come back again. They're going to tell 10 friends not to come back again. It's much yeah. harder. You, you could have somebody in 10 times and show them a lovely time. And then one time this happens, they're gone. And they'll tell well more people about a bad experience than they will about a good experience. You know, so you need to be know who you're working with and also know that you, like, I'm, we're, it's our 10th birthday on, in October. And, you know, it's, it's, you can get, get really good people in, but um, like we made one of our, our bar managers now, our business partner. And, you know, you, you, like having them invested in the place then that, that it means you can take a bit more of a step back. But if you don't have somebody who's invested in the place, you're just constantly going to be like hiring people. The other big thing is look after your staff, like make sure they're paid well, they're secure and you treat them well. We take them on a retreat every year and like we, we, we made sure like we have the exact same staff as we had before the pandemic. Well, I don't know many places in the city that still have that. Like, um, and yeah, if you look after look after your staff and know who you're getting the business with, is, 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 is probably my answer for that. Well, I think that they're very um, very wise things to uh, to impart to anybody. Is um, you know hopefully know who you're dealing with but then you don't really know who you're dealing with until you're dealing with them. <laughs> you're in, you're in, the, in, in the trenches with them but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so um morgan thanks very much i'm just conscious of time people probably want to get back to uh work or various different things we want to uh thank you for uh joining us today and we have a book it's uh, as i say in, in in my best dundalk accent a book and elias is holding it up there i don't know if you can see it it's uh, pub life. Um, I don't know if Elias can. Oh, right, yeah. Can. <laughs> it's uh, a book uh, highlighting lots of Irish uh, bars and Irish pub owners and restaurateurs across Germany. It was an undertaking back in 2018. Their photographs were captured and uh, their stories were told. And it's just a little uh, synopsis of people across the country. So, uh, Maybe in addition to, you might be in it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and some people are just saying thank you for a great, uh, a great uh, session and thanks for taking the time. Thanks for sharing your story. But it's, it's been very uh, informative. It's been very uh, nice having you here. It's also very interesting to hear people getting the tattoos. <laughs> yeah. and, and the story of the, of the, uh, the sushi bars and whatnot. And that's just... <laughs> That just goes to show you in Ireland, it really does, doesn't it? Ireland is a small place. And you said you were flying home to uh, Dublin and someone was sitting on the plane beside you talking about <laughs> the crazy fisherman from Hull. It just, yeah. it, that, that's just the way it is. So, and uh, Michael is just saying thanks. Great story, full of heart and soul. Lots of smiles there. Um, Morgan, thanks a million. And thanks so much for having me, guys. Really fun. appreciate it. It was nice, nice having a chat with you. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. All the best. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Bye.